Good morning. It is so nice to be with all of you this morning as we've gathered from the busyness of our week to slow down even for just this time where we gather our hearts and our minds for worship. God of harvest, God of life, we gather here to say thank you for many things. God of presence in times of change, in times of stability, we gather here to seek the comfort of knowing you are with us. God of bread, product of seeds scattered over the fields, fill us with the hope in this time of worship. From street to street, town to town, nation to nation, God's people gather together in praise and worship. In familiar surroundings, in foreign surroundings, God's people gather to sing and to pray. In a changing world, we gather to give thanks to God who is constantly there. We also gather to give thanks for the many gifts that are shared through the various things that are happening in our church. And so I pass our service over for a moment to Karen Chandler, who will share our announcements. Hello and welcome to our church service today. A few announcements for you to take note of. Our Zoom coffee time this week will be on Wednesday from 1130 till noon and Sunday from 11 to 1130. The details of our Zoom coffee time are in our newsletter. However, if you do need them again, please reach out to Reverend Lori directly. Jesus and Me continues, and you can catch Reverend Lori sharing a story, maybe a craft, a song, or activity on our YouTube channel. And you can find that on Sundays. It's for kids of all ages. Enjoy. Say Cheese, we have received lots of really great photos that you may have seen in our newsletter. Keep those photos coming. It's really great to see what is going on in our church family. Our Stitch and, group, uh, Stitch and Chat group is always busy and keep the recipes coming as well uh, for our cookbook. We will be closing it off fairly soon so we can get that cookbook uh, ready for uh, Christmas holidays and for gift giving, but please be sure to send them in to Betty B as soon as you have them ready. And you know, nothing, even during a pandemic, stops our folks uh, from doing amazing things. Brian is putting together a CD of music that has been compiled from our weekly worship services. Some of the music is instrumental and some of it is vocals, uh, includes vocals. The newsletter has a list of songs that you can choose from. Uh, just let Brian know by email if you'd like one CD with 20 songs or two CDs with 40 songs, and he will prepare that for you and drop it off to you, physically distanced, of course. Uh, Markham Stouffville Hospital is still very happy to receive the baby hats that many of you are making and knitting. So please let Reverend Nori know if you uh, have any baby hats that you'd like to send off to the hospital, or if you'd like a pattern, be sure to let her know and that prayer shawls uh, are gonna be made and uh, they have found a new home at Mark Haven Home for Seniors. And they'll be provided, I think last week that they went over. But if you have any others that you have been making or collecting, uh, please be sure to let us know. And finally, a reminder about contact tracing and that if you are going to the church for any reason to please enter the church from the south door uh, there you will find a contact tracing log sheet. You must enter all your information there. You are required to have a mask when you enter. Uh, and of course, list all of the places that you have been when you entered the church. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Let us take a moment now to gather our lights and to bring the light of Christ into this time of worship where we sing and pray where we share together in a message, a message of hope that brings us together for where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, he is there. Please join me in lighting your candles.
Let us pray together. During this sacred season of autumn, we come with thanksgiving into this holy time, remembering that before the mountains were formed, you knew us and patterned the swirls on our fingertips and colored our eyes, O oh God. God of infinite variety and magnitude, we praise you for life's seasons of bittersweet and beauty sunshine and rain, livestock and fowl, orchards and vineyards, feast days and holidays, for our life, for our breath and for our vigilance during these pandemic times. Creator God, to you we sing songs of thanks. You have blessed us in these days with an abundance beyond our wildest dreams. We think back on this day, the year which has gone before us, sometimes with good thoughts and other times with perplexity. We remember rain, sun, heat, and cold. We have watched the crops grow out in our countryside and in our own gardens, and now we give thanks for all that you have provided. Be with us this day, receive our gratitude, and hold up for us the visions of your kingdom that we might forever be grateful. Amen. Let us join together our voices for our opening hymn this morning, Pass It On, or It Only Takes a Spark. Let us sing together. for our time for the young and the young at heart. This is always one of my favorite times. It's one of my favorite times on Sunday mornings when I have the whole congregation gathered in the pews and, uh, and the boys and girls get to come up and sit with me here on the steps. And I always wonder what kind of questions might be asked and uh, where our story time just might go. It uh, is always such a thrill to, to be able to be with all of you and boys and girls at home. I miss you. I hope you've had a good week. Uh, mine was pretty good. I got outside as much as I could. I love to go for walks in the park and just enjoy the beautiful leaves and 
be out in nature. Well, I have to invite, welcome my friends here too, of course. I've got Mrs. Bonnet and Peepers the Chick. Nice to see you both. I've got Taz. I've got Lily and Danny. Oh, wait a minute. There, Crow. Where have you been? We have missed you. I haven't seen you lately. Oh. Faircrow went to see if the Markham Fair was happening because it usually happens around this time. Oh, I'm sorry. And you found out it wasn't, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, some things have had to be canceled so that we can all stay safe and we try to make sure that everybody gets better from this virus. Well, we are so glad to have you back. I was worried about you. Let's put you back here with Lily and Danny. Of course, I've got our summer bear in his winter clothes. I just love this. I love the mitts. Oopsie, I'm dropping his mitts. Let's just fix that for him. And of course, we have got Chimp. Nice to see you, Chimp. We've got our fire truck to remind us of all the hard work being done by our first responders in so many different ways. We've got baby Suzanne. And we've got our angel bear back here, who our guardian angel who, who looks after all of our friends. And of course, Moose, who makes sure that all of my friends here are managing. And Moose, you must be so happy to have Scarecrow back. You must have been concerned. And we've got Jim, our love bear. We've got our sweater bear. I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying wearing my sweaters these days when it's getting so much colder outside. And last but not least, we have Joe. Joe, what's that? Yes, I know. I wish you'd mentioned to me that Scarecrow had been missing, but I'm really glad that Scarecrow has made it back and that we've got all of our friends here. You are too, that's good. Yes, I brought something to show you. Did you wanna see? Okay, let me put you down then. So, this morning, I wanted to talk to you about how God gets our attention. How God lets us know he loves us, that God loves us. Sometimes it's like this. God loves you. Did you hear that? You didn't. Could be like a wind that blows and, and you sort of hear it a little bit louder. God loves you. Did you hear that? Oh, Moose is having a hard time at the back. He's not sure if he heard me. Okay, well, sometimes God gets a really big voice just to make sure we're listening. And this is how it might sound. God loves you. How can you miss that? God loves you and God loves me and God loves all our friends here too. And sometimes it might, might come as a little whisper. It could come like a hug from a friend. Or it might come like a phone call from somebody that cares about you. And sometimes it might just be as loud as that, that God really, really loves you. May it be so. Have a great week, boys and girls. I look forward to catching up with you next week. And I'm sure Scarecrow will be with us then. There are five ways to give to the ministry and work at Heritage United Church. Number one, you can mail a check or post-dated checks to the church. Number two, you may decide that you wish to set up a pre-authorized remittance. Number three, you can donate online to Heritage via our website. Please go to heritageunited.ca forward slash give. Number four, if you'd like to give using, utilizing your offertory envelopes, you can do that. You can drop it off at Carol D's house in her mailbox, but please let her know that you're coming first. And number five, you may wish to give via an e-transfer directly from your bank account. We are living, breathing messages of God's love for the world. We share our faith and our commitment through generous giving to the ministry and work of this church in Christ's name. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. Thank you for your donation.
as we bring our offering before God this morning, I think of the many, many things that I am thankful for. The gifts that are offered here to Heritage United Church. Those things that happen behind the scenes during this crazy time that you may not even be aware of. I think this morning of the music and how folks that are playing the instruments and singing the songs are not gathered here in the sanctuary altogether. They are doing this in their homes. They are individually recording their pieces. Then they are all being brought together. Thank you, Brian Graham, for taking the time every week to, to do whatever magic you do with the music, to, to join Jennifer's beautiful pieces on the piano and the, the voices of Diane and Karen who have been leading the singing during this time. And Mark, who joins in with his collaboration on, the, on his keyboard. We are so thankful for all the gifts of music that are at this church. And, and while we are missing out on some of you who would normally be participating, we are thankful that this part of our ministry has been able to continue. I am also thankful for the many gifts that are given of cards and emails and text messages and, and phone calls. And I'm also thankful that, that many of you have embraced these new ways of technology and have continued to send in your offering by sending in your checks or you've gone on par or you've embraced the challenge of figuring out how to use Canada Helps and to donate online. All of these gifts help to keep the lights on, to keep this ministry that we have here at Heritage continuing to thrive. And so let us bring our offering before God this morning as we share together in our prayer of dedication. Gracious God, we pray that all these gifts will be used where there is need. May they be a blessing for everyone they touch. May they sustain and strengthen the varied ministries in which we are involved. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. And at this time, I invite uh, Margot McKinnon, who will be sharing our first reading from scriptures with us. Margot. Today, I am reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. I'm reading from the New International Version Study Bible. The letter was written by Paul, is probably one of his earliest letters. And it was probably written in A.D. 51 in Corinth and sent to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was an important trade center and seaport with the road leading to the Danube and the west. It had about 200,000 people and was the largest city in Macedonia. Today it is called Greece and we visited the city and sat at the waterfront and had lunch. It is a beautiful city. Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well because you had become so dear to us. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
Thank you again, Margo, for sharing our first reading from scriptures and, and for taking the time to, to give us a little bit of history behind the reading that we heard. And now let us hear a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, some words that I'm sure will be very familiar to many of you. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. And he said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. God bless these readings this morning. Amen. I want to begin with a story that I read this past week that put a smile on my face. A young soldier and his commanding officer got on a train together. The only available seats were across from a young, attractive woman who was traveling with her grandmother. As they engaged in pleasant conversation, the soldier and the young woman kept eyeing one another as the attraction was obviously mutual. Suddenly, the train went into a tunnel and the car became pitch black. Immediately, two sounds were heard. The smack of a kiss and the whack of a slap across the face. The grandmother thought, I can't believe he kissed my granddaughter, but I'm glad she gave him the slap he deserved. The commanding of officer thought, I don't blame the boy for kissing the girl, but it's a shame that she missed his face and hit me instead. The young girl thought, I'm glad he kissed me, but I wish my grandmother hadn't slapped him for doing it. And as the train broke into the sunlight, the soldier could not wipe the smile off his face. He had just seized a golden opportunity, the opportunity to kiss a pretty girl and the opportunity to slap his commanding officer and had gotten away with both. Let me tell you, the young soldier certainly knew how to seize the opportunity. He knew how to live with no regrets and he knew how to live life on purpose. He knew how to live life as though it was his last day. This story reminded me of one of my favorite songs by Tim McGraw called Live Like You Are Dying. I read that Tim McGraw released this song to encourage people to begin living with more purpose. The song traces the narrative of a man who went to the doctor and found out that he was dying. This announcement jump-started the man who took action. He wanted to accomplish everything that was on his bucket list. He went skydiving, diving, rocket mountain climbing, and rode 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. You probably have the tune in your head now, I know I do. He loved deeper, he spoke sweeter, and he gave forgiveness. He never had. He summed up what he had learned with this piece of advice. Someday, I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. 
Like the man in this song, and like the soldier on the train, we too must take advantage of every opportunity, of every day, of every moment, to live life with purpose, to love deeper, to speak sweeter, and to give forgiveness where it is due. An agreement or covenant that will be our life purpose. One of the first covenants we read about in the Old Testament was between God and Abraham, a kind of soulmate agreement. I will be your God and you will be my people. You will leave your home and family and I will tell you where to go and I will be with you all the way. And I will make you a great nation. Deal? The entire history of the Jewish people from then on in history was a covenant between God and God's people. So when Jesus comes along, they ask him, what is the most important of God's commandments? Which is the most crucial to keep the relationship with God in order? And Jesus replies, of course, it is to love God and to love God with your heart, whole heart, your mind and your soul. But he doesn't stop there. He also points to the covenant within the human community to love your neighbor as yourself. So from the beginning, this amazing tapestry of human community has been woven and continues to be woven to the making and keeping of covenants and relationships. And there is a kind of sacred artistry in the way we do this. Trust, for example, works predictably. It grows as we interact closely with each other, building trust by keeping our promises and being dependable. It is the slow weaving of ourselves together until, well, eventually there is a quiet knowing, which we call trust. And God is what holds all of that together. Joy results as we go through these experiences together, as does healing as we share our brokenness and resolve from mistakes. God is in the midst of that. In our reading this morning from Matthew's Gospel, this is what Jesus spells out. What really matters the most in life and how we can best make our relationships work. The narrative begins with a Pharisee, an expert in the law, asking Jesus a question in order to test him, to trip him up if possible. He asks Jesus which commandment within the law was the greatest as a way of putting Jesus on the spot by forcing him to choose one above the rest. Jesus doesn't hesitate in responding to the lawyer's question. He answers by offering the great commandment, to love God with your entire being, but that adds that we must love our neighbors as, all, as ourselves. In other words, to be loving and welcoming to others, making their needs a high priority. Jesus offers the right, this right in the middle of a theological debate where he was challenged to take a stand and on issues that divide the Hebrew denomination of his time. The Pharisees on one side and the Sadducees on the other. Jesus cited two passages that all Jewish people would know by heart. To love God above everything else and to love your neighbor as yourself. There was nothing particularly original or controversial in his response. But by linking these two commands together, Jesus gave a concise summary of what really matters as we live our lives. His invitation tells us that love surpasses all other duties and all differences. It's much more important than the endless rules of proper conduct that the Pharisees or the Sadducees might debate. What matters is love. We are to share God's love for us with others and all of creation. 
How might we take Jesus' call to love and put it into action? Where and how might we use these words and have them come to life for us, stretching us in heart, in soul, and mind? I was intrigued by the way the author John Mark Komar described love. This is what he said. In love, what does that even mean? Love is a junk drawer we dump all sorts of ideas into just because we don't have anywhere to, else to put them. I mean, I love God and I love fish tacos. See the problem? The way we use the word is so broad, so generic, that I'm not sure we understand it anymore. How should we define love? To some, love is tolerance. I hear this all the time in my city. The idea is that rather than judge people, we should love them. What this means is that we shouldn't call out someone or something that was wrong. After all, as long as it's not hurting anybody, who are we to judge? And while that sounds nice and forward and progressive, it doesn't work for me because the opposite of love isn't hate. It's apathy. And there's a fine line between tolerance and apathy. To many of us, love is passion for a thing. It's the word we, we call on to conjure up all our feelings of affection. We love hiking. Or we love that new song by the band we've never heard of. Or we love chips and gravy. When we aim the word love at people, we usually mean the exact same thing. When we say we love someone, we mean we have deep feelings of affection because they make us feel alive all over again. Adventurous, brave, happy. Love by this definition is pure, unfiltered emotion. And your role in love is passive. It's something that happens to you. Think of the phrase, fall in love. It's like tripping over a rock or a curb. And it's fantastic. But there's a dark underbelly to a feeling that's kind of romantic love. If we can fall into love, then we can fall out of it too. Real love takes a great deal of effort in making decisions as to what is the most important thing to do in any given circumstance. In their early days in following Jesus, he had once told the disciples, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus knew a lot about what it meant to feel welcomed by people. At times, so many people came to, to greet him that he barely had room to turn around. And at other times, he felt their warmth and love when a woman came and anointed his feet with expensive ointment that was worth a year's salary to her. Jesus possessed a capacity for love that went beyond the boundaries as many people observed. He reached out to all sorts of individuals who were not well thought of by the rest of society. He touched the lives of Samaritans and non-Jews who were not considered part of the acceptable society. His love for God was absolute and his love for people universal. He showed what it meant that we don't give love in order to get it, but if we give love freely, our lives will be filled with joy and meaning. I like that description of love. I'll close with a story this morning about a man hiking in the mountains. He was taken by surprise by a sudden snowstorm and quickly lost his way. 
Since he wasn't dressed for the freezing temperatures, he knew he needed to find shelter fast or he would freeze to death. Despite all his efforts, time slipped by and his hands became numb. He knew his time was short. Then he literally tripped over another man who had almost frozen to death. The hiker had a decision to make. Continue in hopes of saving himself or try to help the stranger in the snow. In an instant, he made the decision and threw off his wet gloves. He knelt beside the man and began massaging his frozen legs and arms. The man began to respond and together they were able to move forward and find help. The hiker was later informed by a park ranger that by stopping and helping the man who had fallen in the snow, he had most certainly helped himself because of massaging the stranger's arms and legs, he brought back warmth and increased blood flow to his own hands, thus saving himself from frostbite. Often in loving and serving others, we experience a great benefit to ourselves. It is God's love for us that motivates us to love our neighbors as well as God. This is true for both individuals as well as for a congregation. When we love and show compassion for others, we are, we are blessed and we are a blessing to others. Loving one another matters. Caring matters, but you just can't pretend that you care. Others will know, and certainly God will, but when you love actively and sincerely, it changes the world. It's really that powerful, which is why I imagine Jesus, when asked what the bottom line was, with all the religious rules, gave this one. Love God. And love your neighbor with a sincere spirit so it shows and can be seen by others. When we are able to do that, the world is transformed, and so are we. And here, in this place, among us, God is at work in you and in me, in our lives together. It is a relationship, an agreement, a covenant there are rules, but there are also unpredictability. But most of all, there is trust. We are in agreement with God to love God and others deeply and profoundly. And we are molded and shaped by every movement and every experience we have when we live it up to it in the end. May it be so. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we pause to give thanks. So much blessing in our lives. Too often we take for granted our, or pass by without noticing. Simple and essential gifts of air to breathe, water to drink, light to guide our way and welcome us home. The company of people who care and encourage. Still you notice us and call us to live purposefully and gratefully. God, you remind us, too, that we are all part of a great family. We pray for our many partners in mission and service, for the peacekeepers and peacemakers, for village and community leaders who commit to improving quality of life. You are there in the cities and towns of our province and around the world where there is so much need. You are in the hands of the aid worker. You are in the wisdom of the social worker who sees people, not numbers. You are in the community of homeless who look out for one another. In isolated communities, in any place where despair and frustration twists into violence, you are there as seeds of hope. And so the courage begins in the promise of new life. May we accompany you, God. God of compassion and great kindness, you are present in our lives in mystery and silence. Wrap us in your gentle love and allow us to see you in all the workings of our lives. For those on this day who find the strain of the pace of life too much, for those who have lost confidence in themselves, 
for those obliged to slow down because of ill health or increasing year, for those with too much to do and with those with too little, for those who are worn down in body or in mind by the burdens they carry, we take a moment now to bring before you those who weigh heaviest on our hearts this day. Bless each of them with love and help them to feel your presence in their time of need, O oh God. Be with us in this coming week. We pray that as we are aware of your presence, we will hear and heed your voice wherever you call us, knowing that you, O oh God, hear all our prayers held silently in our hearts or offered aloud as we pray together the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen I invite you now to join me in our closing hymn. And uh, you may have noticed as I ended my sermon there, I slapped my hand because maybe I'm not in this space with one, all of you, which I surely miss. But there are still a few flies that are keeping me company. So I invite all of you at home and all of God's creation to please join me as we sing together, Blessed Assurance. go back to our weeks. The way is forward may seem long, so let us go together. The way may be difficult, so let us help each other. 
The way is going to be joyful, so let us share it. The way is open before us. Let us go. With the love of God, with the grace of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen and Amen.